Center Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during this presentation, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the July 29th edition of Crop Talk. Uh, in today's uh, Crop Talk, we're going to go through a, a quick update, and it's not going to be about uh, all the crops. It's going to be uh, just a few things I was seeing in the field on some of the crops that uh, was getting a few questions about. And uh, then it uh, seems like uh, foxtail barley is one of our the weeds that has been more and more of an issue, and I'm getting more and more calls as to uh, kind of a plan of attack for getting, uh, getting this under control. So I thought I'd... Uh, maybe address a little bit of controlling uh, foxtail barley. And then after that, uh, we'll go to the crop scouting panel and uh, get uh, some of the questions uh, answered for uh, this week. So uh, with that, um, how is the crop doing? Well, it's advancing fairly fast. Uh, these warm, uh, warm days are definitely helping, but I think the biggest uh, thing is the warm evenings. We're, uh, we're getting a lot of the crop growing fast and maturing fast, uh, seeing a lot of the uh, uh, cereal crops, or we're seeing a lot of the winter wheat crops and, uh, and fall rye crops starting to get close to harvest. Uh, we're seeing some of the uh, uh, special crops, the perennial ryegrass. I uh, actually seen, uh, I heard of a, a producer starting to harvest uh, yesterday. So that's starting to happen. Uh, rainfall still is an issue. Uh, we've got uh, wet areas that are uh, are are still wet, and uh, a lot of that crop is dying off. So they're going to be an issue th right through harvest here. Um, regarding, uh, we did get a couple storms this last uh, last week here. Uh, there was a pretty good one that went through Shiloh and up through the Glenborough area. Again, you know. Uh, creating some uh, some damage, uh, we're getting lots of uh, crop now that's in a stage where if we get to heavy rains and winds, it'll be like the picture below. And uh, it basically just uh, is causing the crop to lodge. Uh, the good part about it is the heads aren't quite filled yet. So those, in a lot of cases, those are coming back up. Uh, the bad part is if we get another one like that, uh, those, those areas would probably go down again and, and probably not come up the next time. Regarding corn and sunflowers, uh, they just love in the heat here and we've got the moisture, so they're growing well and advancing well. Um, the, the early seeded corn is tasseling. Uh, the early seeded sunflowers are, 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 uh, heading and are headed out and flowering and uh, some of the late seeded corn is uh, not too far from tasseling. So uh, Yields in those look to be uh, in in the corn in a ways regarding silage looks to be good, uh, maybe average above average in a lot of areas. Uh, canola and peas seem to be the area that we're struggling the most in, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those uh, peas as we go on here. But uh, canola has recovered a bit uh, from the water in, in some of the areas, but again, it's uh, it's uh, maybe going to show a little bit more effects when it comes time to harvest, but any areas that aren't flooded or drowned out are definitely doing uh, uh, doing really well. And uh, canola, our cereal crops are are looking are looking good right now. You get out into the field um, right now is a good time to start checking for fusarium. We're doing our uh, fusarium uh, disease surveys right now in wheat and barley, and uh, it's uh, just just starting to show in a lot of fields. And uh, so now would be a good time to see if your decision to spray or not has paid off. And you can also assess your timing as well and see if you had uh, hit it at the right time. When you look at the map, uh, the map shows that uh, uh, we're in low, most of the areas are moderate to low. And that would be mainly because of the weather conditions we've had over the last three to four days here. Uh, they are calling for maybe a chance of a shower here uh, tomorrow evening, but uh, uh, with uh, temperatures reaching, you know, the high or mid 30s with high humidity, that could definitely bring on some storms. P 
PEs I mentioned earlier on that uh, are starting to show uh, uh, disease fairly bad in some areas. Uh, I took this picture yesterday, a uh, field that wasn't sprayed for disease, but definitely had a lot of moisture issues and, and excess moisture issues. And you could see where uh, the field is definitely ripening in prematurely. Um, the, uh, the green areas, uh, the pods are looking like the, the ones in the, in the top right hand, but uh, the majority of the field is uh, definitely showing uh, uh, probably a combination of, two, of the two, but Microsprella is definitely uh, noticeable throughout the field. And we're probably seeing some root rot issues as well. Close up picture of some of the uh, uh, areas where the uh, peas were dying off fairly fast. And when you look there, you see uh, you know, the premature ripening of the plant. And then you can see some of the spotting on the pods here, uh, definitely having a, a, an effect on yield in this field. And then just a close up of one of the pods showing Microsporella on it. And that's going to affect the seeds quality inside or affect the amount of seeds that actually develop inside that pot. So uh, pea harvest is going to be uh, coming in fairly quick. I know talking to some producers, they're uh, looking in, you know, within the next couple of weeks of doing some, uh, some pre-harvest on, on a lot of the pea varieties. And I think we talked a bit about it. Uh, last week with uh, Dennis Lang was on and one of the questions was timing of application and that was covered and I think uh, uh, just a reminder to producers that if you're uh, you have peas and you are using are going to be doing something on them for pre-harvest to uh, check where you're uh, where you're selling the peas to to make sure that the products you're using uh, are something that they will uh, will uh, accept uh, when you come to deliver your product. So just a, a heads up there. Soybeans, uh, they're loving the heat too, and they've got the moisture, and they just seem to be jumping every day. Uh, and a lot of the pea, uh, the soybeans in the southwest here are in the uh, R3 to R4 stage. Uh, we're just seeing some pod development uh, on on some of the lower pods our lower parts of the plant, uh, even on the top parts of the plant, we're seeing, uh, as you can see in the picture here, there's uh, some uh, small pods developing. So we're kind of right in that stage where uh, we're uh, finishing flowering and getting into a pod development stage. So, um, so that's a, kind of a, a quick update of the crops. Like I mentioned, uh, we're uh, not, not seeing a lot of uh, major insect issues. We're not seeing uh, a whole lot of disease right yet. I think uh, as we do more of the surveys, we're gonna be uh, seeing more stuff out in the fields. But uh, as of right now, things are looking uh, looking fairly, fairly good besides the high moisture issues. So one of the questions I uh, get or I've been getting uh, in the last two to three weeks here is uh, foxtail barley. And foxtail barley has seemed to have taken a hold in quite a few areas uh, and not just uh, it used to be kind of a pasture weed or you know or a, a hay crop weed and it seems to have be spreading out and, and, and covering a lot more area and uh, so uh, a lot of producers are starting to try to figure out what's the best way to, to control foxtail barley and uh, I think when I get talking to them about it it's not a not a one-year plan. Uh, you're not going to get rid of it just by going out and spraying one time and get it, and it's all gone. Uh, you got to kind of come at it with a coordinated plan. So, first of all, what is foxtail barley? And uh, it's a uh, it's an annual slash perennial, and uh, it uh, produces by seed only, and uh, it seems to thrive where there's not a lot of tillage, and that's where you a lot of times you'll see it in in pastures and uh, and actually in, in saline areas it seems to to thrive fairly well there. Foxtail barley uh, can germinate in the fall or the spring and I think uh, the fall germinating plants are the ones that uh, overwinter and resume growth uh, early in the spring and they seem to have uh, seem to be one of the main reasons why Foxtail barley has been advancing as much as 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 it's been uh, when it's time for uh, doing weed control in the fall. Um, maybe not as much of it is being concentrated on those spots that uh, 
have the foxtail barley, and I think uh, this is part of our uh, a first part of our plan to getting control of it. Um, if uh, foxtail barley is fairly shallow uh, rooted uh, plant, uh, and is it doesn't spread by its by its roots uh, or rhizomes uh, like uh, like a quack grass or something like that. So tillage is actually one thing that can be uh, be done to control uh, control uh, foxtail barley. Um, and uh, the seeds of foxtail barley are, are primarily spread by wind. And if you look at the plants uh, pictures on the right hand side, you can see where uh, as the plant matures, uh, lots of fluffy type seeds and those seeds can move a long distance with the with winds and spread. And that's probably one of the reasons why we've been seeing it moving around so much and getting a hold in, in several areas. And like I mentioned, it does well in wet areas, which tend to be something that we're seeing a lot of the last few years here and and they like the saline areas which uh, we seem to be seeing more and more of the last few years here as well so a little bit of controlling uh, foxtail barley uh, first thing I, uh, I i usually like to talk to producers about is uh, i guess is if tillage is an option and uh, it, like I mentioned, it's shallow rooted, so tillage to like three inches uh, is probably deep enough to uh, get rid of the uh, the plant and and also control uh, any seed that that plant was producing because uh, uh, it, you bury it at about three inches, that seed won't be able to make it to the soil surface. So uh, the problem with tillage is that uh, it's going to take two or three years to deplete that seed bank, so you're not going to go out this fall till it and seed it next spring and think you've got uh, got control because there's still enough seed in that that soil layer to uh, to get let the foxtail keep coming so it's uh, that's why I mentioned it's kind of a multi multitask plan to get rid of it um, several producers uh, uh, and I guess the other thing with uh, controlling it by tillage is it's usually in in areas where uh, tillage is maybe not an option. Uh, pasture areas, wet areas, marginal hayland, and a lot of those areas are, are usually tillage isn't, isn't your your first option for control because a lot of times what you'll do with tillage will you, it'll basically just create another problem. So, so what I'd like to see is uh, fall glyphosate application is the, one of the first steps in in getting control of it. Um, you know those plants in the fall, if they're actively growing, go at them with, uh, uh, you know, uh, a glyphosate type product at uh, one to two liters uh, uh, an acre, and try to eliminate the overwintering plants. So if you can eliminate the overwintering plants, you kind of got step one done because this way in the spring uh, you don't have as many uh, many uh, plants to worry about, and you also don't have have to worry about staging as much because when you look uh, at when you get into that spring time period uh, the best time for controlling um, your uh, your foxtail barley is when it's in the you know one to three leaf stage uh, those plants that are going to overwinter if you don't do anything in the fall they're going to overwinter and they're going to be uh, ahead of the game before you look at doing spring uh, a spring application of uh, of a glyphosate product. So if um, you uh, do the fall and then uh, in the spring uh, go out there again and uh, one of the things you could do in the spring is a lot of times the the, uh, the foxtail barley will germinate uh, fairly quick in the spring and get going um, and uh, if it does uh, it'd be good to be on those spots again and, and getting some type of application on it to control uh, control the spring ones that are that germinate early. And then when you do your burn off in your field, uh, you would be hitting them again one more time. So it's actually a three hit uh, uh, kind of approach on those ones. Uh, and uh, that will definitely set them back uh, for that year. And uh, and then when you get, uh, if you're in a cropping situation in the spring, a lot of those, uh, a lot of the, the the crop that you're growing, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are some products now available that uh, will do some suppression of uh, of foxtail barley in crop, and I think that's something where if you grab the grab the 
field crop protection guide, uh, you'll be able to uh, find those products and then determine what crop to grow on there and, and get some control on that as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, basically with the foxtail barley, uh, what I'd like to, do, you know, producers to do is kind of look at their fall application as the starting the starting point and uh, and then go from there and see what the spring brings. I know uh, this past spring in a lot of places it was too wet to get in some of those areas, so you wouldn't be able to do your spring uh, spring application. But uh, again, start there and uh, and it's not going to be a one year control. So with that, uh, that brings uh, my quick update and uh, and and uh, kind of a little bit about controlling foxtail barley. Um, with the questions this week, we're going to go to the panel. And again, there's the information at the bottom for Laurie Forbes and myself, if you have questions to uh, submit to us. Um, with today's questions, I'm going to skip through to this question here to start with. And uh, it's this time of year when we're going to do, do crop scouting that we're starting to see different things happening in the canola crop. And one of the things that we see a lot of times is disasters yellow. And uh, so I think this question will go to Dave Kaminsky as to uh, what causes uh, asters yellow and uh, is there any method of control or is it something we should be worried about? Okay, thanks Lionel. Um, you've got some good pictures on your screen um, of some of the close-up symptoms on canola uh, where the pods are turned into kind of bladder-like structures and the flowers, the petals are turned into leaf-like structures. And then that uh, picture that's an inset, that's what we often see at this time of year, actually the one um, embedded in the, if you're using your pointer line, it's the one in the dead center. Um, we see these fist-like structures that thrust up above the crop, which is now getting heavy with seed and starting to sink down a little bit. So at this time of year, uh, Aster yellow's disease is quite visual apparent in the fields. Even if you're driving by at, I don't know, average speed, <laughs> you might see them in fields, especially at the edges of fields. Um, over on the right, you've got some other pictures, I think uh, reminding us that Aster yellow's is something that affects many crops. You have one picture there of flax and uh, it's the same organism, same disease in many crops. To uh, put your minds at rest, for those of you that are worrying about aster yellows in your crops, I wanna say right up front that you should not worry. Um, aster yellows will not affect yield of your canola. Um, I know of very few instances in a 40 year career in scouting canola fields that um, rarely is there any impact on yield. And it's in a year when everybody will be noticing it. And I think the worst we've seen is 20% of plants being affected in the field. And it's easy to imagine how that could have an impact on yield. But most of the time, our eyes are drawn to the odd plant in the field. So most of the time when we're surveying, we are uh, just rating the field as trace. That is, we saw it in the field, but we picked 100 plants at random and it did not show up in our sample. So that helps you assure yourself that it's inconsequential. The second thing I'd like to say, and uh, maybe Lionel, your pictures don't illustrate that. Uh, so Lori, if I could ask you to share my screen for me. Um, okay, so I'll ask somebody, can you see my screen? I have to click on that. How's that? You bet, Dave, we can see it. You can see it. Okay, that's just again a field overview with one plant in the foreground that is unlike the others. And I don't think we can see any others behind that that's affected. Um, it reminds us of the symptoms 
one symptom we haven't talked about is how in canola, the pods will always be sort of erect or vertical, which is not their natural orientation. Also, the whole plant has more erect architecture because the branching does not spread as it does in a normal plant. And so as the crop sinks down, these more erect plants become more visible. And I also want to show you the vector. And maybe John Gavlowski will chime in because I know that he took this picture and very careful notes about what it is. It is an aster yellows leafhopper. And John, I'm going to ask you to correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, it's shown on some kind of broadleaf crop leaf, but it was collected from a wheat field. So that's the critter that uh, moves this disease around. So the second point I want to make is that aster yellows is vectored by the aster yellows leafhopper and other leafhoppers. Um, it's the aster yellows leafhopper that vectors it efficiently. So we're always watching for the influx of populations that move up from the south of us of that one, the Aster Yellows Leafhopper. Um, this year, I think, um, the disease is being introduced into fields from somewhere nearby by some of the um, native leafhoppers that can survive the winter here. And they also may be bringing the organism, which I won't even tell you what it is. It's virus-like in, in a way. Um, they can bring it from perennial plants, from vegetables that are out there very early, and introduce it to your field crops. And the final thing that I want to say is um, it is difficult, if not impossible, to control aster yellows in canola by using an insecticide to target the vector. Unless you know that you've got high populations of leafhoppers, that they might be carrying the causal organism within them. Um, it's not a fungus, so it's not going to be controlled with a fungicide. And the disease is not going to be controlled by any of the products that we have right now. Um, it would be controlled if it was a real threat using an insecticide. But again, that's a very rare instance when that would be the case. So that's what I had to say today. And uh, if there are any questions, especially if there's clarification needed by a qualified entomologist, I would throw it over to John Gavlowski and uh, be willing to take questions. Any Can comments? you guys hear me, Lionel? You bet, John. Any comments? Uh, yeah, I just want to mention uh, there was one study done years ago at Ag Canada in Winnipeg where they attempted to control aster yellows using insecticides in cereal crops. And they did um, single sprays, uh, sprays every second week, sprays weekly throughout the season. And really the only uh, treatment that really lowered the aster yellows level much was weekly sprays throughout the season, which would be highly uneconomical for the amount of aster yellows that usually appear in any of our field crops. A single spray uh, really isn't going to accomplish much. So unfortunately, it's very sightly, but trying to control it with insecticides uh, would, would be very hit and miss and usually would be uh, uneconomical. I agree, John. It's unsightly, but uh, highly visible. So people notice it, but uh, shouldn't worry about it. Right. Great. Thanks, guys. I will get Lori to give the screen back to me. Hey. John, when we're in canola fields, we're starting to uh, see uh, some pods that are not straight. They're curling up and almost like into a spiral. Uh, what, uh, what's causing that? 
So that's uh, usually caused by thrips feeding. And the reason they curl up like that, the thrips will very selectively feed on the upper part of the pod. And as the pod grows, it does curl into what looks like a curly fry somewhat. Um, there's no economic threshold for thrips in canola. There's been a couple studies on thrips in canola. Uh, one study showed that they usually move in during uh, flowering, uh, when in years when they do come in. Uh, it's usually the flower thrips that are coming in. So they're mo moving in during flowering. They tend to leave very shortly after flowering, but they will do some feeding on the stems and some of the young pods, hence the curling. Uh, the second study that was done was also in Saskatchewan, and they did try to um, figure out if there was a threshold that could be used. And even at the very highest levels of thrips they were getting in the study, they didn't really have a threshold because it, uh, just like the aster yellows, it really wasn't economical. And it's the same situation where it can be visible, maybe not to the same extent. Uh, the the coloring is still the same, but they are curled and you do see them. But uh, if you do a count on the percentage in a field, it's usually quite low. So once again, it's something we don't have a threshold for. Um, it is insect related, but trying to control it would likely not be economical. Okay, uh, thanks for that one, John. Uh, I think I'm gonna keep you on in this next one. Uh, seen in cereals and canola, uh, when I've seen them, they're usually around thistles. Uh, uh, what kind of damage can they do? Okay, so first of all, this is a type of blister beetle called the Nuttall's blister beetle. And there's, there's quite a few different types of blister beetles. Um, some are black, some are like a ash gray color. And those ones actually have a, a beneficial side because their larvae feed on grasshopper eggs. Now this one here, the Nuttall's blister beetle, their larvae feed on uh, ground nesting bee larvae. So maybe not beneficial to the same degree as the other blister beetles. Um, they do like to feed on flowers. Now, carrigan is actually one of their favorite things. As you mentioned, they will feed on quite a few things, such as thistles, and uh, they've got quite a broad diet. We often do see them in canola. Um, they do like to feed on the flowers. In canola, they can be very patchy, and Usually when you do see them in a crop like uh, canola or uh, soybeans, dry beans, they're often very close to the edge and very patchy. I've never really seen a situation that would be economical to treat, but in those patches you definitely do see them feeding on the flowers and some, um, some flower damage that's occurring. The one instance where uh, I have heard of them being actually treated was in field plot situations. Um, some of the species of, of blister beetles really like faba beans, and uh, in some of the faba bean plots, I know they've been treated in the past. But generally, in large field situations, uh, once again, something that is there, highly visible, but probably not worth worrying about as far as control goes. Okay, great. Um, so why why the name blister? Okay, yeah, good question. So th there's a chemical that they can release from their leg joints if they want to. Uh, the chemical is called cantharidine, and that, uh, if you get it on your skin, will give you a blister. Um, you really have to entice them to get them to release that chemical. I've held them many times and not got blistered. You pretty much have to shake them around quite a bit to uh, get them to release it and give you a blister. Uh, the, the one um, case where they really can be a nuisance, there are several species of blister beetles, more in the southern U.S., that have very high levels of this cantharidine in their body. And if horses in particular were to accidentally ingest them, uh, it can result in blistering in their digestive tract, and that can be quite harmful. So if you are ever Googling blister beetles, you might um, 
get reports of them being considered major pests in alfalfa and forage crops that they use for animal feed. Uh, those are different species than we have up here. Our species do have cantharidine, they can give you blisters, but they're not livestock pests to the same degree that some of the southern species are. Great. Thanks, John. Okay, the next question, and uh, this is actually my question. Uh, I, uh, as I was driving and uh, checking, doing some uh, field scouting. I uh, seen uh, this in the in the ditch and uh, on thistle plants. And I remembered talking to uh, John Hurd uh, a while back, and he uh, gave me an explanation. And so uh, I thought I get I took a picture and I get uh, John and maybe uh, Tammy to respond to this one. Well. Uh... I, I do have a story about that, but why don't we give Tammy the uh, chance first to explain, uh, we'll get the, the weed scientist uh, uh, story first. Okay, uh, can you hear me? You bet, Tammy. You're live. Excellent. Okay, so the white, um, there are a couple of herbicides that can do it. So you could see it with atrazine or bromoxynol or even infinity, some of the ones that have chlorophyll um, in inhibition as part of their mode of action. But in this case, in this natural setting, clearly you can look around and see that there's no other weeds that are getting impacted. And so we're looking at uh, FOMA. Uh, FOMA macrostro macrostoma is the full scientific name. And Ag Canada has been working on this as a biopesticide for a number of years. It is a naturally occurring organism in the soil. It's a fungus. And what they've tried to do is rear it so that they can use it as a pre-emergent product for control of things like dandelion, Canada thistle, and clover. It's a non-persistent, so if you treat it with a heavy amount, um, then you can do a fairly good job of reducing plant population. And then later on, in this case, if it's a later infection like this, you will see a reduction in seed production and just loss of vigor. So with this Canada thistle, it'll produce less seeds considering Canada thistle produces a lot of seed. That's probably not a, a huge impact. Theoretically, the seed isn't the best way of spreading Canada thistle anyway. Your root stock and your end tillage are, but, um, but yeah, so it, it is something that they've been working on. Maybe they'll, get it commercialized and get it out and about, especially as consumer trends are towards um, those lower risk types of products, but it does require reapplication every year. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of rotational restrictions. You can grow field peas the next year if you uh, apply it to the soil because it's that low in its persistence. Okay, John, your turn. Okay, well, uh, I wanted to give you Tammy's story first because I think that's more current. Mine's from 25 and 30 years ago because we've been seeing this forever uh, in roadsides. And uh, we actually had a, uh, was a scientist at University of Minnesota, Don Weiss, that uh, was intrigued. And so, yeah, he tried to culture uh, the bacteria out of this. And they did some work on, on you know, culturing it up. They found it. Fungus, be fungus, John, fungus, fungus. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They called it something different, but it's similar. Yeah, they called it a bacterium. Anyways, uh, uh, they found that. I'll just uh, go with the current fungus. Okay. Uh, I, okay, we'll go with your story. Anyways, they couldn't culture it very well, and they found that it also would maybe affect the sunflowers. So they decided it's best to keep that genie in the bottle and not to try to rear it too much. So anyways, that's that's where we are on that. Hey, thanks guys. If you're worried, if you're worried that I'm wrong, you can also go to the Ohio State in addition to Egg Canada, and they call it a bacterium as well, John. Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, this was, uh, I guess I had it for Dane. Um, I got this picture last night from a producer that was looking at his sunflowers and was wondering what happened to a few of them. Um, Dane, or uh, uh, what do you think of that? 
I don't have Dane on currently, so if mm -hmm. you want to give a sh go. Um, okay. I'm still on the line, Lionel and uh, Lori. Okay. And uh, since Dane might not be, um, I want to say that this could be a number of things. Um, some of them might be herbicidal, and I'm sure that's what people think right away. Um, but a plant this small, we're looking at it from the top down, and I don't know how tall it is. But if that was um, a plant that has emerged not too long ago, there are some diseases that uh, mimic sort of herbicidal symptoms unless you're looking close. And a test is to turn over and inspect the underside of those leaves. Uh, there's a systemic fungus disease known as downy mildew, um, which can cause yellowing and distortion of leaves. Um, there may be some other viruses that I'm not aware of that also cause that kind of symptom. Was there a specific? I think you're question? spot on, David. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're spot on there, David. We had lots of samples of this come in last year as well, and everyone wanting to talk about potential herbicide injury. But when you did flip over those leaves, it was obvious that it was exactly the symptomology that you're looking at. So I appreciate. Thanks, Dan. So what stage, um, because you, Dave, you mentioned uh, it was, if it was a smaller plant, it could be uh, downy mildew. Um, this, I think, uh, at when he said, I got it last night. So I'm thinking the plants, the rest of the plants are probably quite a bit bigger. Yes, uh, this is probably a later emerging plant. Sometimes okay. seeds don't germinate because they're too shallow and they're close to the surface. And it's only when they get some moisture later in the season that they pop out of the ground. So I think that might be the case. Okay. No, that's good. That's good information because I really seen it last night. And first thing I was thinking, well, what type of uh, uh, chemical was sprayed nearby already in my head, trying to think of what, uh, what the drift might be. So uh, uh, good comments and thanks for that. Lionel, just to add to that, it, it it is possible that it could be herbicide as well. There are some um, herbicides that'll concentrate at the growing point. Group twos, for instance, would shorten your internodes and and cause yellowing, probably some reddening as well. But there there is that possibility. I think in addition, like if you don't see the symptomology that David talked about by flipping the leaves over, then looking at the pattern in the field and looking at what crops are around, it could help. Uh, that one individual plant is always a danger to make an assumption based on that, but we can certainly follow up more if there's a few more details. You bet, thanks guys. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to go back to my foxtail barley and uh, Marla Rickman had a couple of comments she wanted to make and I think they were real good comments. So I will, I think we've unmuted her. Marla, uh, if you could uh, let the people know what you were telling me, I think those are some good comments. Yeah, I was really happy to see that you were giving this uh, kind of an update on control foxtail barley because Foxtail barley and salinity management really go hand in hand. And so when we're talking about things like tillage in order to control foxtail barley, it even that shallow depth of tillage that's required, which is kind of nice because it's shallow rooted and it's easier to control with tillage, even that shallow depth of tillage will dry out the surface soil allow for more evaporation and that can bring up salinity. So because foxtail barley is usually in these saline areas, management with tillage is maybe um, a, a kind of a lesser wanted management style. So controlling it with glyphosate or other non-tillage means is really what you want to be looking at. But if you do have a situation where you need to manage it with tillage, I want to note that you want to plan for what is growing into that area once that management is done. So if you're controlling foxtail barley in a saline area with tillage and then planting it to a crop 
that just is not going to outcompete that foxtail barley or other saline tolerant weeds in the future. It's just going to continue being an issue. So where you are controlling that area, think about a plan for what is going to grow in that area other than foxtail barley that you are putting in. So putting in a forage, putting in a saline tolerant crop or something that can manage growing in that area. So instead of the foxtail barley, you've got a region that has something else that's more kind of wanted uh, that can actually grow in that region. Great. Uh, can I add a couple little things as well, Lionel? Oh, sure, Tamia, yeah. you bet. Okay, so one of the other questions that we get asked a lot is, if I add AMS, will that help out my glyphosate? There isn't a lot of studies there, I guess it depends on your water quality, whether AMS will help out your glyphosate, or if you have maybe um, some challenges as far as the size of the foxtail barley. So one leaf foxtail barley, we know that's super, super tiny and very hard to stick anything to. And so when you're doing your spraying applications on newly emerged foxtail barley plants, they typically recommend going at that three to four leaf stage so that you have some leaf surface as a target. And that becomes a real challenge if you have not done that fall application like you recommended or had some sort of tillage. Great. And AMS is to um, um, help ensure that you've got a, a fairly good size. Great. Thanks, Sorry? Tammy. AMS? AMS is ammonium sulfate? Yeah. Yes, ammonium sulfate, you bet, which sometimes helps with. Okay, you're kind of breaking up there, Tammy. So uh, I think we covered what uh, we got, what you were trying to get. So uh, we will go on to the next question. Uh, got this question yesterday, and uh, uh, these producers uh, grow a lot of barley for feed, and uh, they were wanting to know if uh, how long uh, is the barley head susceptible to fusarium head blight. Uh, they were told that uh, you want to spray when uh, the head comes out, uh, but they've also been told that uh, uh, the infection can happen later on as well. So I thought it would maybe be good if uh, Anne could uh, address this one. Sure, I guess I'll address it and then if um, David has any additional comments. So barley is obviously most susceptible when it's in flower, when the head is just starting to come out of the boot. Um, studies have shown that uh, cereal crops can be infected, have late infections of fusarium head blight. And in lab studies, it's shown that up to two weeks after flowering, they could be infected. So I would think that two weeks would be the maximum, but that would be under kind of ideal conditions. So um, obviously you'd be most concerned right around the time of flowering and you could see a late, late infection of fusarium, but it wouldn't be um, that common. And in the lab settings where they did see late infections of fusarium, uh, conditions were really dry at the, around the time of flowering. So they kept the plants dry so that fusarium couldn't infect the head at the time of flowering. And then later, say like seven or 10 or later days after flowering, then they had moist conditions. And at that point, they did find that fusarium could uh, infect the head. So I think that it's worth considering what the conditions were like at around the time of flowering. And if they had conditions that would be really conductive to fusarium head blight later on after flowering, then there would be a risk, yes. Okay, uh, David, are you still on? Okay, um, and uh, so would another application of uh, fungicide be something that you could look at in that case if conditions were like, our conditions were fairly good for fusarium, so would that be something that somebody might consider? Or? Yeah, the, the studies that they've done in the, so I should back up by saying that in uh, Manitoba, I believe in 2017 and 2018, there was some on-farm trials with the Manitoba Wheat and Barley Growers Association looking at those late applications of uh, fungicide to prevent fusarium head blight. But in both of those years, conditions were very dry and it just wasn't, the study, it wasn't a good time for the study because we didn't see infections of fusarium head blight in general. 
Um, but in the lab studies where they did look at this, they found that late applications of fungicides did lower um, the amount of Dawn in the seed. So obviously that's the main concern. So, um, you know, if right around the time of flowering, maybe conditions aren't conductive, say a few days late, maybe even up to a week late, it might be worth spraying. Um, if all of a sudden you get that heat and moisture that would lead to more fusarium infections. Okay, good, thanks for the information. Uh, next one for John Gavlowski. Uh, I actually took this picture last year and uh, was just wanting to uh, get John to tell us what's happening to that grasshopper. Okay, so what you see, the, the red things underneath the wing pads, those are called red velvet mites. And right now they're in their immature stages, so they're in their parasitic stage. Um, red velvet mites can be predators. So these are the same mites you see early in the season. In May and early June, you see these red mites running around on the soil. At that time, they're adults, they're in their predatory stage, they're eating insect eggs and very small uh, insects. When they get into their, when they um, start laying their eggs and they get into the juvenile stage, the juveniles will get onto things like grasshoppers and other insects. And on grasshoppers, we often see them underneath the wing pads. They're parasites, they're not parasitoids. So a parasitoid will kill its host. Even one parasitoid will end up killing its host. Parasites can live on the host and not necessarily kill them. Now, if you have a lot of them on a grasshopper, it may, in effect, kill it. But if nothing else, they're weakening them. They are feeding on the hemolymph, which is the uh, grasshopper equivalent of uh, insect blood. So they're feeding on the grasshopper's blood. They, they will weaken it. They might reduce its feeding somewhat and its reproduction. And again, very high levels might uh, end up killing them. I have been seeing some of these, um, a, a canola field just south of Carmen I was at the other day. We took some grasshopper samples and I was seeing some red velvet mites in that population. So I do know they are out there. Uh, the other grasshopper natural enemy that we're seeing right now, we're seeing some grasshoppers dead at the top of plants. And again, this was more south of Carmen. This was noticed in a couple fields. And that's a fungus that kicks in when you see them dead at the top of plants. The fungus changes their behavior. They die clinging to the top of the plant. Eventually, their, the spores build up in their body. The cuticle splits. And being high in the canopy, the spores can then spread around. So a few good grasshopper natural enemies helping things out. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, the next one is for uh, John Hurd. Um, he had some comments to make about potash deficiency showing up. Okay. I am. Okay, I think I'm live. So uh, thanks for this picture. Uh, I had put some of my own pictures in here and, and could show those later, but uh, it is something we're seeing right now where we have uh, uh, anything that's restricting root growth in the corn crop. Sometimes we see the potash deficiency with the yellowing on the leaf margins. And uh, uh, if you took a soil sample here, you may find that the, the potassium levels might be adequate. But uh, uh, you, if you have a restricted root growth because of compaction uh, or things like that, then you get the symptom showing up. So uh, it's a good thing to uh, investigate. Uh, Lino, I don't know if you can go to my slides here, and I'll just show you how how I diagnose that. And uh, am I on there? Click yeah, on your you're, yeah, we can see you. Uh, so do you want to go to your uh, display setting at the top there, John? Oh, yeah. Oh, I seeing... have too many screens set up here. That's okay. We can sort this out. Got my little laser printer already set and loaded and shooting. <laughs> and uh, swap. Yeah. There we go. There you go. 
I still have my red dot on there? We sure do. Yeah. Okay. So uh, for, for first, what took me to the field I was looking at uh, was these drought symptoms. And um, it's kind of funny when you see drought symptoms and you take your shovel and dig and find moisture in the soil, well, then that's sometimes telling you something else. And then uh, you see these critters also in the field. I think Tammy tells me that 58 or 59 percent of those uh, kochia are now resistant uh, to, to some 59. of our popular herbicides. And uh, uh, anyways, they're also to me, they're an indicator weed of, of salinity. And so when I see this type of drought stress and moist soil, uh, I'm going to take a soil sample and confirm that it salts. So we are starting to see some hurting corn. So this I was thinking was drought plus salinity, still waiting the soil test back on that, but we've got an indicator plant in there. Uh, the other thing, uh, the diagnosis of that compaction, Marla gets all kinds of questions about using penetrometers. I have uh, the dial of her penetrometer there with someone sticking it in the ground. You can get those from Dickie John for just under $400, uh, Google Granger Canada, or you can get a shovel for $30 at the co-op and probably get better information by looking at the roots. And here we're looking at uh, uh, those roots growing pretty flat. That's a, a symptom that they're growing uh, in a plane, but they're not penetrating these walls. And at the top, you can see those roots might be misinterpreted as a herbicide injury because of those stubby root tips, but actually we're just dealing with very very tight soil here. And this is why the plants are also struggling to take up water and potash or potassium. The, uh, and we can see the traffic, fall harvest uh, traffic patterns uh, in that field. And so it, it is just ugly. In, in corn, we call the compaction issue, the tall corn, short corn syndrome. Uh, and corn just tends to show this. The other crops are probably out there suffering too. It's just not as, as blatant uh, for what we're seeing. And then I just wanted to follow up uh, with what you started us with, uh, Lionel, that uh, yeah, if we look at those plants, not as nice as your picture, but that firing is on the outside of the leaf margins. And that's very typical of potassium deficiency. Interesting here, we see the, the planter trench showing up and fertilizer was applied in a two by two band. So potassium was supplied to this plant, but if the roots are just growing in this plane here, they seemingly are not accessing some of that uh, banded potash. The other thing that's going on here, that, that uh, deep ruts from last fall, often that's subsoil compaction that we were picking up uh, easy with the penetrometer, but to dig, then you see this platy structure that was caused, I think, by the disc, which was disking was done to fill in those ruts. And uh, this is what uh, I, Marla talks about in the, the CDS uh, lesson, uh, platy structure where uh, these planes go back and forth. The roots struggle to get through. Sometimes they'll get through but other times they just end up being stranded uh, close to the surface. So again, this just continues to be a year when farmers continue to be punished for um, soil structural problems. And um, hopefully we don't have another fall, wet fall, where we um, continue to do this damage. Any comments, Marla, if you're still there? Okay, I, I guess not. So uh, thanks, Lionel. That's that's all I had to report uh, from this uh, past week. Great, thanks, John. Uh, Laurie, if you can give the screen back. I skipped over this one, uh, John. Uh, if you could uh, comment about this. Uh, I was uh, in a canola field and seen this as well. 
Okay, so yeah, this is an interesting caterpillar. Um, it's, uh, it's a type of woolly bear caterpillar. Some people call it the yellow bear, although uh, sometimes they can actually be white, and there's actually several common names for this one. Uh, they are the larva of a, a tiger moth. They have very broad feeding habits. You will see them in many different crops, uh, soybeans, canola, um, mainly broadleaf crops, very rarely in um, numbers that would be considered even close to economical. They're, they're more of a, again, with their broad feeding habits, they're in a lot of things. Um, but just like the Nuttall's blister beetle, they can be very easy to see. Uh, they're often high up in the canopy feeding away and being larger and quite bright and hairy, they're easy to see. So um, don't get too concerned if you're finding the odd one of these. They won't destroy your canola crop. They may dip, nibble away a little bit, but uh, we've never seen numbers come anywhere close to economical. So we, we really don't have thresholds for them in any of our crops. There's nothing registered. Uh, again, they're sort of regarded as something that's there, but not really uh, pest status. Just goes to show me that I can't stump John. I was through that one thinking he might not have it, but right off the top of his head. Thanks, John. Okay, um, Lori, I just want to check with you to see if there's any other questions before we go on to our last few slides. I don't think so. I'll double check and uh, chime in if I see any more. Great, thanks, Lori. So again, uh, the seasonal crop reports are still being uh, updated. Uh, you've seen the fusarium map is still being updated. Uh, John and his group there do the uh, uh, insect and disease update as well as uh, crop growing conditions and the crop report are all on our website. So definitely if you're interested in getting those reports, uh, there's the process to do it right there. Uh, the uh, Farm Production Extension Specialists uh, in Manitoba here. So if you've got questions, uh, don't be afraid to give these people a call. Uh, they definitely will uh, help you if, uh, if, if you've got some questions or find people that uh, can give you a hand. And I guess, Laurie, uh, uh, if there's no more questions, uh, I'd, like to th I'd like to thank everybody for attending and join us next week, August the 5th. I think we might be getting close to some harvest at that time. So thanks again for attending.